My name is Nanette Carter, and I've been coming out to Sag Harbor since I was eight years old. And so I have fond memories of coming out and visiting the Parish Museum, even as a young child. Yeah, just fond memories of coming to see art. This was an art mecca in many ways. I chose, I think it's around 25 pieces or so. And when I was there in the room, as people were bringing the works out, I felt like, I felt like it was Christmas or something, like people were handing me gifts. Of course, I couldn't take these home, but it was this sort of procedure of one, of a, one at a time bringing them out so that I could see them, see them in person, see the scale of the work again. Online, you don't get a sense of scale. Color could be off just a bit. So that was so helpful, but it was so exciting, so much fun. And now to see them up on the wall, professionally hung, looking great, you know, the lighting, um, they're all talking to each other. And I have to say, when I was in my home, you know, looking at these images on the computer, what drew me to these particular pieces was this sense of looking at different worlds, worlds that we don't see on an everyday basis. This is coming straight out of an artist's mind's eye, their creative instincts, you know, and I think with these works, as I see them all together, uh, there's also an energy that's there, that's just, it's vibrant, it's, it's compelling. Uh, some of them have a real sense of movement. I mean, these are stagnant pieces, but they're moving. Uh, the eye traverses the surfaces. They're rich surfaces, tactile surfaces, um, playful. I'm looking at the Elizabeth Murray right now, which I understand is a new acquisition. So I don't believe it's been seen at the museum yet. I'm really excited about that. And so the other thing that I was really fascinated with was that a lot of the pieces I've chosen haven't been seen since the 90s. So, you know, to bring them out from the back and let folks see what's here, what the collection is like, 125 years of collecting. I'm looking at Mary Heilman's piece right now, and as much as it might appear to be a bit on that minimalist strain or genre. When you come in close and see all that's happening, and I think she's really reflecting on the beach, and one sees the beach, the sky, the night sky, all of it all on one picture plane. Daylight, nighttime, a roaring you know, ocean, uh, clouds, and all of that on one format. And so, you know, even then, it, it's, it's, there's movement. There is that sense of movement, which I really enjoy. Um, and my piece, which is behind me, which is a collage, and I've situated uh, two of my mentors, really, people I've been very greatly influenced by. Um, one is Romer Bearden. He was the first black collagist that I had ever seen. And I just enjoyed this idea of that edge. There's something about the edge in a collage where you see the physicality of one surface against the other. And you actually see that slight relief aspect as it lifts up, you know, just the thickness of the paper or whatever. I love the physicality of the collage. And I think I was drawn to Romeo Bearden in particular because he certainly was sort of vamping off of Picasso, but he took it to another level. I think that he included such a painterly aspect. He also brought a lot of uh, images from Ebony Magazine, from different magazines and all. And the way that he cut up the face and then reorganized it, and it really reminded you of African sculpture, um, but again, I like the physicality of the collage, and that's what I'm certainly doing with my pieces. And because I'm working with mylar, 
and the gauge of the mylar, the thickness of the mylar, you really do see that physical aspect I'm talking about, how the artist is layering and positioning. Um, deckle edges I love, you know, uh, when people are working with paper. So the edge for me uh, just signifies this other placement. It's not the paint that's being built up, it's this other surface that's being layered and built up that uh, I find to be very exciting. The other artist that's hanging next to me is Frank Wimberley, who lived right down the street from me in Sag Harbor. And he's probably the first black abstract artist that I'd ever seen or met. And so to see his collages, I recall him showing his collages where again, tearing the paper, that deckle edge. Um, and he was using uh, the paper that I think Bearden used quite often, and it was a paper that was silk screened. So when you t tore the paper, you actually had the white edge. So I know that he was a great influence on me getting involved with collage. Another reason why I'm really excited about this show, because I have so many female artists, um, and some whose names you may not know, and I like that also. Um, I don't know how many people know uh, Judy Hudson. Her work is stunning, and in fact, I think it's probably one of the most surreal pieces I have in this group. That floating world, I think, also I'm seeing quite a bit of. I think with my work, certainly it's floating on that wall. It's not framed. There's nothing that's um, containing it. It literally does float on the wall. It's, and uh, I'm looking at uh, Theo Hios's work, which I believe is also floating. So this floating world, which I think is this, almost this Asian aspect to uh, the way the history of, of art is presented. I don't think in European art we had that sense of the floating world as much as we see in Asian art. I have to say I at one point wanted to be uh, an architect and this idea of building, I think because as an architect you're actually not building the building it was best that I became an artist because I could build the building. I could build what I wanted to build. And I feel as a collagist, that's what I'm doing, especially when I'm working on a large scale, getting up on a ladder, putting pieces together. Um, I'm a builder. You know, I think I'm a builder more than a collagist just because of the scale that I work. Artists back in the day, we're asked to speak as much as they're asked, asked to speak today. We are asked to speak all of the time, which is amazing and it's great. Because you have videos now, you know, social media. I never knew what de Kooning looked like. You know, I didn't know what most of these folks looked like back then. You just knew names. Now we know faces. I mean, it's incredible the changes that have taken place in my lifetime. We know their voices. You know, we, we, we hear their voices and how they speak and gesticulate and what have you. We didn't have any of that back in the day. It's incredible. So I feel like I know some of these artists because of that. And younger artists get a chance to, to hear and see. Yeah, get a better sense of, of who they may be looking at seriously, you know? Very different time, very interesting time. Mm -hmm. Ugo Rondinone. I'm a Swiss artist. I moved to New York in 1997 and I have a second home order and a studio in Matitok. I mean, coming out here seven years ago, I was at, uh, like 
everyone, you just explore the spaces or, or the surrounding. And I, I got a house with a, with, a, with a small studio that had farm tools in it. And it turned out they, are, they were all handmade. And just by, by experimenting, I would uh, spray them with a gold with the gold spray and it felt as if this handmade tool, rusty tool, became a jewel. So I wanted, to, uh, I was just fascinated by these handmade tools first and secondly that by putting gold leaves on such a handmade prestigious thing it would, be, it would elevate the, the tool into a, a desirable object. So I would like to point to one object that started it all. It's a shovel. It's a shovel to use that you would use for grain, and it's made out of wood and it's hand carved. And I, I, I found this in a garage sale, and I was fascinating that someone would go through the difficulty to carve not a work of art but something that he could use. This was the, the trigger moment three years ago when I said all those tools that were somehow abandoned, or many of them were abandoned, should have a second life because of the love they got by, by someone who took his time to make something beautiful for to be used. So, and here he gets a second life. So, uh, coming here to Long Island, see that, that history of uh, hard labor made me think about my parents, who are still alive. Uh, they immigrated, like many Italians before them, to Switzerland. And, and I never really reflected, or uh, there was never a work that was reflecting of their past and their ancestor past. That's why I call it in plural, as because there is a lineage of labor workers and there is a, like a connection to all of them. And this should pay homage, this work should pay homage to it. Uh, I mean, the, the, the quest was to choose an artist and the parish has a fantastic uh, web page and I could go through and there were many uh, works that attracted my attention and then I felt to, to Alan Shields' work who was very much a part of Long Island and very much a part of the hard-working Long Island. He was a, a ferryman, he grew up also in, on a farm and um, uh, his father died young, so he was grown up by his, with two sisters and his mother, and that's where, I, where he saw how to sew. And, on the, and he would also work. Uh, he came out, I believe, in '82 and started working as a ferryman. And on the side, he had also his studio. He never stopped working. And by chance, I mean, those are situations that are not planned. I didn't know that the parish was built on, on a farmland, for example. But it, those are the lucky coincidences that, that, uh, that just adds, adds to the story. I knew what I wanted to achieve with my work. There are 26 panels and they are organized as a grid. It's not a fixed grid, it can change depending on the spaces. The 26 panel refer to the title that it has. It's, it's called the alphabet of my mothers and fathers. So I reduce those panels to 26, like the alphabet. Each panel is dedicated to one letter. And to see an Alan Shields work with, a, with, with the idea of the grid and the transparency was uh, quite stunning. And of course, there is some duality as much as there is similarity with the grid, but there is a duality between a soft work and a hard work, a colorful work versus a monochrome work. 
and this can go on. But both deals also with handcraft. So my, I chose my tools. They are uh, specifically, they are all from turn of the century. They, ha they were handmade. And that's how I, that was the criterion to choose the tools. And Alan Shield did something unusual as a painter that he, he would saw the painting. So the sewing machine became his tool, which is quite stunning what he could achieve with that. The surprise is because the work floats, Alan, and all of a sudden I saw those tools floating, which was uh, something that I never had imagined before. That it be, because they are all heavy tools, but together they animate a certain lightness. And that's the beauty of it. I mean, the surprising part is that Alan Shieldsworth makes it possible through his transparency to see all of my work. So it doesn't block anything, it just in integrates it and makes it a perfect fit. So I was very pleased about this. I mean, my work feeds on opposites. I follow my work and the work gives me a direction. Here, the alphabet has its base really in the handmade tool. So, in a, where, so there is almost a grain against nature because it's working with nature. They work with the, the earth. So I see that connection. It's still working with the land, something that you can touch but it is a tool to manipulate the natural material of earth. And of course, words itself can bridge many meanings, but in the end, I would like that the person comes in and just feels attracted and seduced. And over time sees the little details of how certain tools were made, that each one had the tension of one person to make it this way. So it was important that the work relates. I'm very practical in that, scene, in that sense. So I'm, the surrounding in, in, in influences my, uh, the, the, the outcome of a work. So goes also with those farm tools. And of course, by uh, there is many connection to my work per se. I, th there is a, a kind of a nostalgia going through the work, a nostalgia that elevates emotions per se. And this was dear to me because it uh, relates to my parents. So it, it, it's a, a work about love and about recognition and what they made possible. Uh, so in that sense, it's a, uh, yeah, I would say it's a labor of love. I would bring in archetypes. So I work with symbols, which are related through universal without including language. So they have an immediate reaction because people see and can recognize what they are looking at. So I work with archetypes like the sun, the tree. They are mostly coming from nature. Huh? Or in this case, it's really the labor of work. Huh? So it's the tool that, it's for, that becomes an archetype, something handmade, something that you can hold in your hand, something that relates like a, a lineage of people who did, who worked with their hands, as I do.
name's Leslie Stradford and I live in Sag Harbor. So I've just become familiar with Parrish over the last year and a half. Um, I visited a couple of times and then I was pleased to find that I had been selected to participate in the Artist Choose Parish. I was sent the list of artists, some of who I was really already familiar with and some of whom I was not. And um, I found uh, Mother Wells' work, uh, as well as a couple of other artists who I was familiar with, but I thought that his inspiration was sort of where my momentum came when I was uh, in undergraduate school. And I always loved his work. Um, you know, his ability to be able to create things sort of spontaneously um, and yet very simply uh, and have a lot of impact in the work without uh, being figurative. Earlier on, I started working with things that were typically um, related to women. Uh, Q-tips and sponges and, you know, things like that. For the larger works, I have kind of used the same things. Um, I've used mops and I've used poured, you know, uh, mixing the paint and so that it's poured in squeeze bottles like hair dye or something like that. Um, and then, you know, all different kinds of palette knives uh, of one shape or another to create different kinds of strokes and thicknesses. Um, I, I tend to water down, or not water down, but in this case, you know, turpentine, <laughs> thinning it out so that um, it, it becomes very layered. So I, be, I began doing, you know, kind of one thing and then it, it sort of takes over and creates itself. Generally speaking, I work on one work until it's completed. In some cases, I don't, like I said, I don't think about what it is that I'm going to do prior to doing it. But then some things will come back to me as I'm thinking about my work. And it, it just sort of creates itself. Uh, it's sort of like, you know, sort of a spirit moving you. Um, and I tend to be uh, more interested in uh, black and white imagery. Yeah, I think it's, you know, very dynamic. It makes a bold statement. I like color too, but I don't use it as often now at the moment. Um, that may change, but uh, I, I once heard someone say, you know, if you can master black and white and shades of gray, you can do anything in color. I started working with all these different colors of black, and so I didn't realize that there were so many different colors of black, <laughs> uh, and how they change dramatically um, when they're applied. And so most of them are, you know, I see there, as a matter of fact, there were uh, paints that were called black, but they weren't black at all. Um, and so I use some of those occasionally, um, but it gave me the opportunity to see how, how, how diverse both black and whites can be and, and how, they, how they manage to work together. I've also been interested in um, uh, different other artists' works, um, like Solange, who's uh, who just uh, passed recently, and um, and how he was the master of black, and um, and so that sort of intrigued me. This year, um, I started working on them when I had a, a large enough studio to be able to create larger works. But most of my works are very similar in, in nature to these that that I have. Um, some were inspired um, just through, I guess, just letting the, the, the moment sort of flow, let it, in, without, spontaneous, without any forethought of, you know, what it was going to be like or what it was that I was looking for, just the opportunity to be able to create these works and then, you know, I would find things that sort of surprised me, um, how it related to photographs I had seen in the past, but I wasn't really conscious of the fact that that was on my mind when I was creating the works. I think this is the first time I've seen anybody open up their, um, their collection to artists who are here to choose works that 
um, reflect what they're doing or encourage them or inspire them. And um, yeah, there are, um, there are other works that I saw that I you know, kind of had an, an interest in. But it was nice to be able to see the archives that you have and, and um, all of the various kinds of work that are included in your collection. And I think it makes it really very vibrant for the other artists as well to be able to see that their work has some uh, intonation of other artists' works who, who they take, um, you know, that they have sort of a, a reflection of in their work, that inspiration that comes from that. It seems to me that you're really reaching out to the community and you have such a vibrant artistic community here that it, it just works. And there's so many artists here and there's so many really good artists here. Um, very different than you know, other places that I've been. And when you as you know, when you begin to take a look at artists' work, some of them begin to look very similar to each other. There isn't a real a distinction between one artist's work and another. But here I found that there's a certain kind of linkage um, that each artist sort of has, and they use that, and you can recognize their work when you see it. Um, just like Mother Wells work or, you know, Jackson Pollock's work or, you know, there's, there's a thing about it that differentiates it from a lot of the other artists' work that I've seen. I think that the museum is great, you know, it's very welcoming, the rooms, the, the various uh, uh, exhibition spaces are great, and it gives everybody, you know, young and old, an opportunity to see things that they can relate to. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased to be in the show with, with such other illuminators. My name is Jeremy Dennis. I'm an artist and photographer based here on the Shinnecock Indian Reservation in Southampton, New York. I think my first major uh, involvement with the Parish Art Museum goes back to 2018 to the Parish Art Museum's Roadshow. I work with uh, Corinne Ernie and we um, went to Duck Creek in Springs, East Hampton to uh, create a show around my series titled Stories and it's a series that looks at indigenous creation stories. So it's a series that explains how we as Shinnecock people originated. And so I thought it was really good timing and very appropriate because this was sort of the um, breakthrough with my art and really um, got me started as an artist. So after that, I've really continued to stay in touch and work with the parish um, over the years. I um, think back fondly to Tomashi Jackson's exhibit, Land Claim, uh, looked at different themes of um, perhaps accessibility, um, different historic issues and conflicts in the area. And so I thought it was, um, of course, appropriate to include Shinnecock, just because um, Land Claim has so many different meanings, so many different important communal initiatives and politics associated with it. And so in many different ways, Shinnecock and the parish have a lot of history in common, a lot of um, reconciliation, perhaps, <laughs> is a word that could be used. And um, I think Tomashi Jackson's show really made that apparent and put it to the forefront. I was also recently involved with the Another Justice show involving Hank Willis Thomas at the Parish Art Museum. Uh, myself and other indigenous artists were actually featured on the Shinnecock Monuments on Montauk Highway. And this was really exciting because in my mind, the first time that um, art was displayed in such a um, public and <laughs> uh, immediate way. And so thousands of people every single day drive past the uh, Shinnecock Monuments on the highway. 
and it was just amazing that it wasn't really for commercial uh, needs, it was more for social justice and uplifting Indigenous voices. Having the opportunity to look at the Parish Art Museum's collection, um, there's so many objects, but when I think of the parish, I think of uh, William Merritt Chase's uh, landscape paintings of the Shinnecock Hills. And um, for, I guess, one positive, it kind of shows or archives what the Shinnecock Hills looked like maybe a hundred years ago. When we think of American art history, it usually starts with a landscape. And I wouldn't say that um, Chase's painting, paintings were different, even though they came later. Um, in most of them, it's um, people coming to what is the Hamptons today, um, enjoying the beaches, enjoying the fields, um, and just kind of frolicking <laughs> through this empty landscape. And um, for the most part, Shinnecock people are absent from this um, array of different paintings. And so I wanted to, in my Artist Choose Parish um, artwork, create a piece that is in conversation, that actually fills the gap of that omission of Shinnecock people. And so they're meant to be hung together in conversation and maybe they are part of the same landscape. Maybe it was my artwork propped out from the other. And it's really just the idea of um, the form itself being a white frame in the same ornamentation. It's almost as if it's part of the um, architecture of the parish. And so appropriately, it'll be hung in the spine and in many <laughs> uh, parallels. Um, I think that's just uh, a metaphor for how Shinnecock people and the land and the things that have happened over the years are so integral and part of the parish. And so I wanted to just highlight this. I wanted I want viewers to walk away thinking um, they know William Merritt Chase's paintings. They come to the parish for these paintings, but do they know the other side of the history here? And so I think it will be a moment of reckoning for people who see this pairing and they really can't walk away without wondering or perhaps doing more research to understand this pairing. So the work that I'm including for the Artist Choose Parish show, it comes from a series titled uh, Sacredness of Hills. And this was really a um, relatively new project. I still think of it as so. <laughs> it started in um, 2018, around the time that the uh, Hawthorne site in the Shinnecock Hills um, became a major news story. And so as an artist um, trying to educate and create awareness around this injustice, I wanted to reacquaint the public with our sacredness of hills. And so with my series of photographs, I really want to reacquaint and associate Shinnecock with these hilltops. And so whenever you see a hilltop, it could be a sacred spot, it could be a sensitive area for our ancestors. And this um, series of photographs basically demonstrates that by showing indigenous people um, in these spaces. So they inhabit hilltops. Um, in many cases, they're in these places that have been disrupted. So it could be gravel, it could be under construction, and it has an, an indigenous person there as an observer and witness to this desecration. And so with the piece from the Artist Choose Parish, I wanted to um, maybe push it further and actually show the parallel between the um, 19th century and how the Shinnecock Hills once looked with its um, short grasses and bushes and how the William Eric Chase paintings um, appear as well. And just the idea that Shinnecock people were there and were witnesses to this uh, desecration and we still remember the injustice. And so as an artist and photographer myself, I always try to find the practicality in art and always try to make it educational if I can. And so each one of my works, they are usually accompanied by um, a, con a context or some sort of wall text to explain the meaning. So I believe in art, I believe in history and its um, ability to show that we're all connected in that way. So I'm hoping that um, we continue as artists and culture bearers to um, keep the work going because it is um, balancing out the division that's happening in the world.
Eric Fischel, and I live in Sag Harbor, New York. I've been in the area of um, the East End since 1985, and so my relationship to the parish goes back that far. Uh, I used to, you know, there was always something to go see whenever we were out here. It was a, a destination site. I feel uh, uh, very it's kind of blessed to be asked to be included in an exhibition in which artists are asked to mine the uh, collection of the parish for, you know, uh, works that are resonant with their own um, uh, things that inspire or artists that mentored them or whatever. Uh, I think it's it's significant to be for a museum institution to stay connected to the artist. I think, uh, you know, for, for the artist to, to stay connected to works of the past is a, a, a really important thing as well. And uh, my experience in doing that and going into the vaults and stuff was basically like, you know, a kid opening Christmas gifts. I mean, it was, you know, one surprise after another. It was. It was great to see stuff, uh, see a, 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 you know, a, a, like a Long Island sensibility or something that began to become apparent through the, through the work. So what, what started to emerge was that, you know, the collection is, uh, uh, has a strong base in genre paintings uh, and that the genre paintings uh, covered two sort of traditional uh, uh, things, one formats, one being uh, landscape and the other one being portraiture. And uh, I gravitated towards the portraits, which also held the same thing. It was a lot of portraits of uh, people that were connected in various ways to this area. And uh, um, it was interesting to see, as I was looking through it, that something emerged that I wasn't expecting, which was how many portraits of women and women of means, uh, privilege, uh, were captured by the, the male artist in a way that captured intelligence, it captured a, a person, you know, a, a real person, a real personality, that the gaze back was as strong as the gaze into. And, uh, and so that became a way of seeing if I could build out from that into the work that I chose. You know, my job as, a, as curator of this exhibition, as well as being an artist, is not to try to rewrite the past, right? But to see something in the past that gets can get pulled forward in a way, maybe recontextualized, etc. So, as I say, what the the work that I chose that yes, it's it, it's very class based uh, work because that's what what the preponderance of the collection was uh, you know that was the people who commissioned portraits commissioned portraits of their wives or whatnot and you know people dressed in a certain way for the that or the portraits of their children and you know whatever and they're they're portraits that are if they reveal something it's unintentional or it feels unintentional and uh, Except that I think that there's a sensitivity of the, the male. There, there's only two uh, works in here that were done by females uh, artists. The others were all male. So uh, when you see the, the way the male was looking, uh, the male artist was looking, there's somewhere you feel that they're getting behind the presentation enough to either show a, a an unexpected confidence uh, and that that it goes past the the clothes or a uh, or a, you know or subverting it in, in some way so well it, it, uh, it it's always been important to me in in making my work that the people depicted seem real which means that they're 
You believe that they're in a situation, and they're in a situation that they're either comfortable being in or uncomfortable being in. But nonetheless, it's a real moment and stuff. And so, uh, you know, part of that, in terms of the work I chose for this show, has that range to it. There, there's some women depicted who are present and whatnot, but wary of, of what is being asked. And then, uh, and then there's some that are uh, women you know, looking out with uh, uh, intensity and a, and a you know a, a self-possession and whatnot that uh, compels me as well. You know, hopefully they're they're w within this moment of of uh, reevaluation of power systems uh, and uh, and you know the the where is the male. You know, uh, always uh, put into all males fit within the, the male power structure, even though they don't. But then it's generalized into that, that kind of uh, uh, simplification and whatever. All, all males looking at women have an invasive nature to it. That's all lumped together and, and not true. Um, Anyway, so uh, you know, it was a, uh, th this gave me an opportunity to represent uh, uh, from a male point of view, and and also echoed by all the males that painted the portraits of women, uh, a reevaluation of that generality, and and also to me as uh, somebody hanging the show to to simply demonstrate that. You know, powerful women are not to be subjugated or, you know, re relegated to corners of rooms and stuff like that, but can be front and center and still be powerful and, and you know, and, and non threatening, et cetera, you know, whatever. So, you know, the richness of the East End, and that's North Fork, South Fork, et cetera, the history of it, as well as the contemporary with, with the amount of just extraordinary people that are in the creative fields that are out here. You know, it's like, there's no other place like it. The, the parish has to stay here. It's absolutely essential that it's part of the overall identity of this place. But uh, I, th I definitely think that, you know, asking artists to go into your vaults and find out what's here and connect to it in a way that connects them directly, you know, they're going, oh, I, I see myself here, right? I didn't know I was, I, I thought I was different. I didn't realize that there was a continuum that I'm a part of that they were sensitive to one way or the other. You know, they showed me before I was me, you know, kind of thing is, is pretty cool, so, yeah. I should make that a t-shirt, right? <laughs>
in part of their permanent collection. I don't, okay, I'll tell you exactly how I feel. I used to be in awe of people who did art, you know, who can, you know, make a painting, you know. And then I started making painting, and that all went away, <laughs> you know. So uh, I try not to have, uh, spend too much time, you know, on a critique because <clears throat> I wouldn't do it any other way. You know, like, you know, you look at something and say, oh, it should be this, but where is that coming from, you know? Well, I started out scribbling. I was, I was a, you know, a scribbler. And then I uh, had an affinity for painting as a child, you know. But uh, when I got to adolescence, I uh, switched to music because I like the image. My work is improvisation, totally. So um, <clears throat> it's a what you see is what you get kind of thing. <laughs> so wherever that comes from, which is probably where I bought every place I've ever been, you know, that's the output, you know, and I, um, I pro pro you know, approach uh, painting as I do playing a tune. You know, it comes. Well, at that point, you were uh, asking, you know, to uh, identify with certain artists in the collection, and uh, <clears throat> only one who could come to my, could come to my mind at that point was Pollock, you know, because I know his history and where he was, you know. So I, re I took it from there. I didn't go any further. <laughs> oh, this last one, uh, it was a coordination. You said, uh, I had looked at a piece by Pollock that you presented, and at the same time, a live performance choral piece was being done, and I videotaped it, and that's the piece I made for that one. This is an improv improvised work done in conjunction with a choir from uh, the Ruby Bridge Museum. It's, uh, the proposal was made that we, I would paint a picture while they sang on an improvisation, and this is the results. That was about uh, October. It was zoomed there in Arkansas somewhere, so it took about 30 minutes. <laughs> 30 minutes, because, you know, we were in it. What, uh, what happens naturally always surpasses my uh, <laughs> expectations. is my name, and I um, live and work both at Sag Harbor. I thought it was really interesting. It, well, this is going to be a challenge. I didn't know how much of the work uh, that I would see pictures of from time to time, what was really in the collection. And I thought, oh, well, it'll be easy. I, I'll just take my concept. Uh, a concept, uh, an approach towards an installation in the room, and just find and pick artists that would um, work uh, with what my initial approach uh, would be. But then when I started researching, I found out what an extensive collection it was, and when I went to see the actual works, um, it, and I was I thought, oh my gosh, this is really interesting. The works are fabulous. And it, in a way, I felt it was like a collaboration for me because I learned from the artworks what it was that I was interested in, in doing. When, when the, the first invite came out by you and your team, uh, it, it was, um, it, I really studied what you were, I tried to assess really what you were looking for, um, because I had been to many of these um, 
artists choose shows here uh, for a long time, years and years. And I, um, but this seemed different to me because what I understood from it was that a recontextualization for the next century was really being sought to perceive the works and understand them uh, through a, a completely different lens, not the way you're just taking works that may look like or share one or two different issues conceptually with the artist and the artists that they chose, but a much broader uh, concept to me seemed presented. So I really was very influenced by the writing of that particular invitation, which, so I took that literally and approached it. I just, um, having people view these works in relationship to some of my works too, um, from different perspectives, climbing up a stairway to look down on, on the floors and look look from above and across to the different walls to lay on cha chaise lounges. You looking up, you get a, a totally different perspectives, and you're relating to the architecture also of this the spaces, the gallery space. Um, I felt that it was Im important for each wall to and floor to tell a story that had its own um, flavor, let's say. Um, and I learned that through the works that I had in my uh, concept to um, make, make stories that were uh, like there, for example, a, a ghost wall um, with Jackie Beale's panels of The Last Supper. And um, then in collaboration with um, my works, a, a cantilevered foot going through the wall or a, a wing tongue, uh, that's a social insult coming out at you and also a uniform that's like a ghost swinging slowly. And what it all has in common for, for me was this uh, idea of wondering what's on the other side? What, what's on the other side of, of life? What's on the other side of the walls? What's I mean, the, here in death row? With this, um, these artists' works, I felt this kind of um, frenzy, frenetic kind of energy reflecting the world that we live in now and actually have been for quite a while. And I wanted this wall to reflect the, uh, the anxiety that one could experience um, that is found found in, in, in these paintings and um, also they also felt like, um, like Tara Donovan's for example felt like a maze where there was no beginning and no end and just like looping everywhere, nowhere and uh, round and round. Uh, I just thought these pieces worked so well together and the shade next to it, the shade drawing was it's reflecting some of these, um, these these kinds of voices that are expressed in these works as you, the sounds of these kind these that these paintings can give there was a, a secret kind of mental audio translation that i was involved with via salmons is up there as an architectural a uh, window, it's like almost like a you're looking through a skylight. I'm using it as a sculptural detail to see her, st her beautiful twinkling um, stars through this frame, architectural frame there. Of course, Mary's work, um, which is what I was talking about, Mary Heilman, this symphonic element to it, uh, I, I just found really interesting and 
she was really interesting to me, um, Louisa Chase, because in a way, her work ha has an embodiment of all of what I'm re reflecting here. Again, there are different stories on the wall. For, for this, I felt um, this kind of like frenetic energy uh, and the use of color and the scratching uh, and the friction brings about such a, a, a wide um, a wide framework with which to look look at her work. This is Chuck Close and um, the chair is a slipped cover her chair that I had made out of uh, granite um, inlays and wood and uh, it's a very uh, heavy set chair and you walk in and you're, I feel that the chair is inviting you to sit down and sit very close to, to this self-portrait of uh, Chuck Close and you're really like in confrontation with, you know, that you're there. And um, again, it's that interaction, stories, these walls and floors are stories. You, I feel that the people become characters in these scripts as well, visitors to, to this installation, because they have to really confront what it is that they're finding. Oh, oh, oh and there's um, um, Holly Solomon up there, by the way, a, a portrait by Max Kozlov, which I found it was so interesting. Only, only interesting was Holly is up there, like looking down, and it it um, it, it, it felt like um, this photograph that Max did had a. It was locked in color, like a. It was almost like a color cast, like a like a physical. I mean, like almost like a um, a mummy cast, like you're locked into it, very engaged, and she's there looking down and you're looking up at her. It's a very different perspective. I always found the art artists here and the curators and the art writers very interesting. It wasn't mm, it wasn't as though I felt like, oh, New York City is where it's all happening. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, it, this, this area has always been a very exciting, interesting um, coming together of artists and writers, it's, and literary writers as well, aside from art writers. And it, it's, it's always been that way. Joe Zucker, East Hampton, New York. Well, it's been a, a long relationship because I had a show at the parish and a one-man show of the 100-foot-long piece. And Donna DeSalvo, who was inheriting the curator's job at that time, did the show. And that's got to be not too many years after we moved out here in 1982. So uh, I would guess that I met those uh, shortly after Alicia Longwell and when uh, Klaus Curtis was an adjunct um, curator. Uh, that period, I'd say, of uh, the early 80s, mid 80s, very active in New York. So there was an, a, a lot of uh, artists moving in and out of the parish. And I, I think the 80s is when I first went there. And over the years, I've done other things with the parish. And I've given some works to the museum. I've put a lot of work into it. I looked at a lot of landscape paintings. The, the, the first 
row of things to look at were most of the seascapes. There was like 300 different horizon lines. So you can see how what I'm doing this time, how it relates to our situation. That's one of the reasons I chose the, the ocean or the, the, the ponds, because water is a key factor out here. You move to the Hamptons, you gotta buy a boat. If you can walk, you buy a boat. Anyway, I, I have a long relationship with the parish. And what I've chosen to do by bringing the, the 19th century into the picture is two things. One, give people a chance to see that the parish was a player and has phenomenal collections, Japanese prints and etchings, which people should look at. So I went to something I'm sure is appropriate, revealing the works of people who haven't seen it in years. But like Peter Campus is, is, is no, I don't know if anybody's choosing Peter Campus other than myself, but he's a major American artist. And I chose Betty Parsons as a quintessential dealer, one of the most successful female dealers there was, the sure pain. I selected Malcolm Morley because not only did it was Malcolm, was he an interesting painter, he was a tremendous performance artist too. He wandered the streets of New York dressed as Vincent van Gogh. I, I chose uh, two Japanese prints. Hello, flatness, 20th century American art. It's gotta be flat, here you are. I think there's uh, Winslow Homer, the con consensual watercolor painter of the 20th century. It doesn't matter that it's only this big because I'm dealing with 60 feet of space. And I want that space. That's a very difficult space. You have to activate it. If you're going to put like historical works there, you need something to say, hey baby, I'm over here, you know, zone red. You know, it's, why would you do that? Well, well, the burlap, I, I think the burlap, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's from the past. And I thought it would activate that, that wall is a problem because it's so narrow. You can't put, I, I figured that if it's red, it'll draw people. It'll, it'll be here, the red, and people will see it and know, what is that? Why is that wall red? And if you're putting paintings that are hard to see, or you want to come up, you have to do something. So that's one of the reasons I put red on it. Red is also, it's lively. There's people I know that I picked that are the museum quality etchings. Process, which I'm involved in, the, the, the art of making art, uh, some of these works are involved in that. The etching is, etching is a, a, as you have it in your museum is a lost art. These things are phenomenal, these black and white uh, etchings. But certainly, I, my decision was to show these things to teach, in a sense, to show something that's art historical. This one is came after a, a group of paintings that were dark. And this is about the French 19, the end of the, uh, the 19th century, you had those the, the, the flags and the uh, blowing in the wind and uh, colorful, positive subject matter, the humor. I mean, the bottom of this painting are, are the sharks. And that's how I numbered the paintings, is by using a shark fin. Because I was here, this is the, uh, also 
It's about the water. There's tremendous amounts of water to deal with. And, and in the 19th century, there was artists like Prendergast that came here. I probably have painted as many marine paintings as anybody in the last 25 years. I think the issue here was to, to make good for the parish. Partly it's supposed it's about, not about how cool the art is. I mean, it, it, it's, it's about bringing to life that this museum's been in functioning so long. And you, you, like so many museums, you don't see these things. Well, I think that what's happening in the art world is an opportunity for the parish to deal with some active things. I, I think that's, uh, a museum is about art history. Galleries are about making money. And I, 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 I think that uh, uh, this is just a, a chance to start uh, with what's going on today. You know, who, who, is, who, is, who is left in the past uh, and didn't get shows now should be getting them. Mm -hmm.